most people think national minimum wage is about paying a national minimum wage rate, and it's not. It's about recording accurate time work and making sure it's paid following any deductions or other items which may be considered for the benefit of the employer. So some people think, oh, if I just pay the hourly rate, that's fine. But then they operate hours rounding. So if someone's in late, they knock off 15 minutes when they're five minutes late, or they make them stay behind to cash up after shop closure, but they don't pay them for that time, or they make them train at home. There's all these sorts of things continue. And there's an element of understand national minimum wage law because the enforcers are coming. Welcome to the Payroll Podcast with your host, Nick Day. Find out what it takes to truly discover what it takes to elevate your career within payroll as we meet with the industry leaders who are shaping the industry for tomorrow. Hello and welcome back to the Payroll Podcast. My name is Nick Day, CEO of JGA Recruitment, a specialist payroll recruitment firm and host of this Payroll Podcast, which of course you can find on iTunes, Spotify, and of course on our very own website, jgarecruitment.com and across all other major podcast channels. Now today I am joined by Simon Parsons himself, Director of UK Compliance Strategies at SD Works, who serve over 70,000 companies with payroll and HR services worldwide. Now, Simon has been a major contributor to SD Works' payroll expertise since 1984. Besides being influential in the development of SD Works' payroll services, he's also a major presence on a number of HMRC consultative groups and committees. We're going to find out more about that during the course of this podcast. Simon is also a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Payroll Professionals and one of the original Masters of Science in Payroll Management. You may be wondering what that is. Don't worry, we're going to be asking that question in just a moment. Simon is also a regular author and speaker on subjects related to award and payroll. He's chair of IRENE, the Electronic Exchange with Government User Network, and honorary chair of the BSC, the Chartered Institute of IT, Payroll Specialist Group. He's also launched his own website called payadvice.uk. It's a site I know very well because it basically includes all the breaking news, expertise and guidance related to payroll. And I am often visiting that site myself to include his articles in our very own JGA weekly payroll newsletter. If you haven't subscribed to that, either check out Simon's website, which I'll include in the uh, episode notes, or our very own. Now, Simon has been named in the Reward Hall of Fame list since their inception in 2009 and has won a number of awards for his payroll services and we're going to find out a lot more about his career during the course of this podcast so sit back relax and welcome Simon Parsons to the show how are you feeling yeah very good thanks Nick and it's uh very welcome there uh, it seems strange doesn't it you think uh I'm still young how can I have that sort of pedigree Absolutely right. You're definitely still young. I've known you for, God, it's nearly two decades now. So uh, I must be young as well alongside you, which is great. I mentioned in my intro that you, of course, were part of the original cohort of the Master of Science in Payroll Management. I know when I mentioned that, there'll be many, many people in payroll who won't be familiar with what that is necessarily. So I'd like just to start with a simple question, really, which is what is your background and how did you become involved in the payroll developer industry? Um, yes, my background is IT, but uh, I, could, I could go back further, Nick, because uh, my parents were conscripted into the army during the Second World War, and uh, my father was a crack shot with a gun. He could uh, get any target, volunteered, wanted to join the RAF and fly, but he was blind from birth, uh, so uh, got positioned into the Army Pay Corps. That's where he met my mother. And so you could say a genetic payroll is in my genes sort of thing. So both of them met. Uh, my father became a charter secretary. My mother was an accountant, but in the Army Pay Corps. So I started, left school, joined what was Sun Alliance in their IT department. But about four and a half years in, then was recruited by Centrefile in London. So I went and commuted to Cannon Street Station, uh, just near the Bank of England, where the Centrefile office was, and started my career, you could say, in payroll IT development, writing new payroll software solution back in 1984. 
Amazing. So tell us a little bit about the Master of Science in payroll management. What was that all about? So, uh, yes, a number of years working at Centrefile, I asked them if I could actually probably follow in my father's footsteps and study for the Chartered Institute Secretaries to kind of deal with business law and accountancy. And they said no. But there's this organisation, what was known as the British Payroll Association at that time, or BPMA. They're running a course at the University of Westminster, FASC course diploma. Would you like to do that? And I said, yes. So I actually joined that, but they cancelled it because I think there were too few take-ups of students. So I then did the two-year correspondence diploma. And then uh, it was announced at one of the annual conferences of what then was, the, I think, still the BPMA. It might have started to become the IPP, that they were running a Master of Science. And so along with uh, five other colleagues from Centrefile, we enrolled. So it was part of that first cohort of joining the Master of Science, which is a joint enterprise between the University of Westminster then and what is now the CIPP. It took a uh, couple of years to undertake that course and graduated with merit and carried the initials. It's strange actually going to university, especially as, a, as an older student, because they treat you like you're a kid. You know nothing because you're not qualified in anything, even though you may have the diploma in payroll management. Uh, they treat you like you know nothing. And then the day you graduate, you're treated like you're an expert. <laughs> so it's really strange. Well, I'd like to think it's moved on a little bit since then. You've obviously seen, as you said, the uh, when I first came into the industry, I think it was the IPBM, but you've obviously seen it change many times. We obviously, for those new to the industry listening to this now, they'll be more familiar with the CIPP acronym. Uh, but of course, you mentioned there you initially joined Centrefile in 1984. And not everyone listening to this will be familiar with Centrefile. It's a business that I knew well when I first came into recruitment, uh, as I said, nearly 20 years ago. Uh, when you joined in 84, you left for a couple of years and joined again in 89, and then again rejoined Centrefile uh, when the owner Ceridian rejoined Centrefile in 97, who of course are now owned by SD Works, which is obviously who you are employed by now. You've also won a CIP Person of the Year in 2006, uh, the Pair Alliance Award for Advancing the Pair Profession in 2010, and of course, what I would say is the highly coveted Strathern Lifetime Achievement Award uh, in 2012. So you've had some journey, and it's been an exceptional payroll career, if I may say so myself. What I would like to ask then is what have you really learned during this time? And what is it you, you love so much about payroll that's, that's led you to, you know, launching your own website and actually, for those that aren't familiar, giving so much back to those that, that need support uh, very much on a pro bono basis. And you only do that really if you've got a real passion for the subject. So tell us a little bit about, about your passion and your journey. Sure. Well, I seem to have a natural knack of understanding complexity, especially around payroll law. So it is a little bit of one of my specialities. Uh, probably irritates a few people, maybe, because uh, <laughs> it just reads relatively clear to me what the meaning is behind the law, and which is possibly different to the intent of government. But there's an element of we're going through very strange times. We have been now for a couple of years going through the Brexit negotiations and even through into the pandemic. Payroll industry is in disarray with the amount of change and payroll software development is very strange. Notification of change is very late. The national insurance changes, for example, for this year weren't notified until January. That's the latest I've ever known it. And so there is a clear passion, I tend to say, of wanting things to be clear and available for the industry so that uh, the software developer community can get on with it, as it were. And I've been involved first meeting probably Norman Green back in 1989, I'm saying from memory, and Colin Broad, those sorts of characters that have been around for years in payroll software development at the BCS and being involved meeting with government officials to find out what changes were impacting. And for some reason, it's just organically grown in the interactions with government. I'm probably a bit of a mug, to be honest, uh, Nick. Um, yeah. If someone wants help, I'll usually volunteer. So, for example, I'm, I'm the chair of Peterborough District Scouts 
So all the scouting in Peterborough, I, I chair that district. I don't run the scouting, no, but I, I chair it. And, uh, you know, I've been a lay minister and a missionary before. Uh, it, it seems chair of Irene and chair of BCS. It seems like if someone's saying, oh, we've got anybody that can help us, for some reason I've forgotten to step two paces back or my hand seems to go up automatically <laughs> and I end up helping. I don't know if that helps a little bit on where the passion comes from. But um, when, when I first joined Centrefile, which is now SD Works, so Centrefile in those days was NatWest Bank, was taken over by Ceridian, and now is SD Works, a Belgian group that's been going for 75 years in the payroll industry. So it's a little bit of a celebration there. One of the biggest bureaus there are probably in the UK as well. When I first joined them, they kind of gave me a little task and and I thought, you know, just got this little problem for you, Simon, that we think you'd be good at. Could you solve that? And and I did. And then, oh, we've got another one. Uh, would you do that? And I did that as well. So if I talk about what those were, one was director's national insurance and the other was uh, attachment of earnings orders. So they wanted an automated solution that would just come in and do it. And this is back in the 80s. And there's an element of, yeah, we did them. We put them in the solution. They worked really well, even worked till today, to then realize that actually they were giving me the duff jobs that no one else wanted to do. Uh, and I guess being the new boy, you get that, you know, it's kind of get the two-tone paint and find a two-tone paintbrush type uh, activity. But I did. So I did find the two-tone paint and the two-tone paintbrush, and it does paint two-tone up and down the wall. So I had a little bit of a knack for dealing with those sort of really complex areas, and that's continued throughout. But I found that actually um, to get on, don't be afraid of difficult things. Um, I once heard an interview with Claire Rayner where she mentioned that she was uh, struggled at that time, single mum, desperately needed a job and went for an interview. At the interview, she did really well and they offered her the post, but one of the conditions that she knew how to operate a piece of machinery and she said she did, but actually she didn't. So she didn't know how to operate at all. But so she was going to join in a week or two. She phoned up the manufacturers and went there and had the demonstration of this uh, uh, medical equipment that needed to be used. And uh, she was the most proficient user of that in the hospital they'd had. And I think there's an element of don't be afraid of difficult things. Uh, delve into it, find out what it's about and give it a go. And if you fail, does it really matter? because no one else could probably do any better. And you've learned along the journey. So I think I've always learned to not avoid difficult circumstance. I think it makes you strong. It's a bit like doing fitness training or uh, uh, doing physical outdoor activity. It actually brings a little bit of excitement. Is, is it wrong to say payroll is exciting? No, I don't think at all. I think you've articulated that very well. I mean, certainly I've, I'm have i definitely someone that's leaned on you for advice and support for when I've had queries from clients and candidates that, you know, I'm not a, a payroll expert in terms of <laughs> legislation whatsoever. So I tend to pass them on to you. And uh, maybe I'm one of those monkeys that jumps on your back and says, can you help? And you always tend to say yes. And you've always been a superb support for, for, for me in those situations, which I owe you a great thanks for. But I think it's also a great quality that, you, that you're out there trying to help others. And I think that shows through your career as well. And with the with the awards, that you've won you mentioned that you've you've also been chair for the bsc payroll specialist group for a number of years um i understand you were recently re-elected by the members again so congratulations uh, there and you're also chair of irene um so i just wonder if you could tell the listeners you know a little bit more about what the bsc payroll specialist group is and and, and 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 irene as well who they represent and what they actually do yeah, so the BCS, um, the initial stand for British Computer Society, but they tend not to use that long-term name. They call it the BCS, the Chartered Institute of IT. So it has the Royal Charter, and it's there to represent all software developers in the United Kingdom. Uh, but it is a worldwide organisation as well, so it has members throughout the world. But it has a payroll specialist group, and uh, that payroll specialist group is a uh, formation of software developers who meet together with government probably about three or four times a year normally. It's been very difficult through 2020 to meet, but it's been very difficult to get anything out of the government that's solid. They represent the software industry in promoting standardization, 
understanding of complex solutions uh, and implementation so that we're ready. Now, this year is very strange because we don't actually know what changes are happening in April 2021. So we'll have to see how things go. Irene used to stand for the Inland Revenue Electronic Exchange Network, but um, a group of people that were dealing with electronic exchange with governments, formerly known as EDI, or these days we might call it RTI or XML, but the precursor to RTI, met at Aston Villa Football Club. And there were a number of interactions between large employers who are interacting with government electronically that uh, uh, Joan Woods of HMRC suggested, or Inland Revenue in those days, uh, suggested that we form our own user network. And that was the birth of Irene. So it has about 900 members and represents, in effect, all employers in the United Kingdom to promote excellence in electronic exchange and help lobby or encourage or jostle HMRC into making improvements. For example, the earlier year update is no more. It's replaced by a full payment submission at end of year for corrective activity from 2021. That's just one of the sorts of things that Irene would have attempted to lobby for and exchange with our HMRC software development support team colleagues and policy makers to encourage improvement. Much bigger than I anticipated. No, that's why I didn't realise it was so big with 900 members. I, I probably anticipated it to be be much smaller, but uh, it sounds like it's a, it, it's a large group. Um, sounds like it's needed as well. It's great you've got the HMRC involved. I, I've read a, a couple of acronyms which are BIP and PIP. Can you tell me what they are? BIB and PIP. Yeah, so the, there were some groups some years ago where the government uh, consultations seemed to be having some trouble or areas that needed to be explored within some industry reps. So I'm very inclusive. Some organisations sometimes aren't, but I'm a very inclusive sort of person. So as the British Computer Society, we are there to represent all software developers. So there's an element of when we wanted to bring in real-time information, what the HMRC did or the government did, uh, and collaborate on it, that we promoted the formation of BIB, which is the BCS, Irene and BASDA. So BASDA is the Business Accounting Software Developers Association, headed by Pauline Green is the chair of the payroll group for them. And we work very closely together. And the intention is to work together with government. So HMRC have a BIB group, Bays have a BIB group, and it tends to be uh, same, about eight, 10, uh, software developer representatives that are representing the industry as opposed to themselves. It's important that they represent all developers rather than just their own personal interests, although there'll be an element of uh, a bias there, but it's important that they represent the industry. And that led into PIP. So PIP was, uh, uh, I'll say it the way I believe it should be. So that's payroll, industry and pensions. The pensions will say it's pensions, industry and payroll. But I don't really mind what they <laughs> say. It's payroll, industry and pensions. And that's a group that actually initially met with uh, Steve Webb in the DWP offices at Caxton House to explain to him why pension AE would not work. And then he brought in some changes uh, with the policy people there to actually make it that Pension AE could work for October 2012. And it's generated since in the formation of a standard, data standard called PAPDIS, and also in regular consultation meetings with the DWP and the pension regulator. Our liaison officer there is a chap called Andy Nichols, who I know very well from the past as well. He used to be a, an IPP or CIPP or BPMA tutor uh, back in the old days. So I used to come along across him at uh, some of the weekend schools. But yeah, it's to promote pension AE uh, establishment. So no, hopefully I, that explains those acronyms. It does. I think it's great because, you know, I've, I've been in this industry for an awful long time. I'm not, a, as I say, a, a payroll processing professional, but it's amazing to see there's so much going on 
you know, out of uh, out of my eye shot, if you like, I wasn't wasn't familiar with these with these kind of organisations or groups or, or, or people coming together to, for for the betterment of the payroll industry, which is fantastic. It just goes to show the scale of it. And actually, you know, often we're very focused on the administ- administrative side, and we, for me, it's very easy to forget there's a whole software development side to it as well, which absolutely needs to be considered. That ultimately drives the administration side. So yeah, it's exciting to to, to know what's going on, and great to hear that you've been part of that, and uh, well, and chairing most of these committees as well. Now you, of course. If you were also involved in the original HMRC Moses project, um, I know that SD Works were one of the very first electronic exchange organisations uh, were heavily involved in the consultations uh, and the design of real-time information with HMRC as well. I understand your specialism at SD Works now is related to compliance strategies within the payroll industry. So where do you think the big risk challenges are now for UK PLC? And, and also, maybe if you can, if you could just um, explain to, to the listeners a little bit more about what that original HMRC Moses project was, and perhaps also your involvement in the the original design of uh, of real time information. So, it's three questions there, Simon. If we can dissect those one by one, that would be great. The Moses project was uh, in, instigated about 1998, which was in effect the birth of electronic data interchange. So that's the exchange of tax codes between HMRC and employers electronically, and also the submission of P45, P46 pensions data and uh, and works number updates which is the precursor to the introduction of rti so sd works as it was named at that point something else but sd works implemented edi back in 1999 had to go to some unusual measures in effect uh, squeeze the project in under the table take a few shortcuts in getting approvals and sneaky development but uh, we delivered our RTI for an end of year reporting in uh, 1999. There will be other organisations that would have come on just before us. I'm not going to name them, uh, the compet- some of the competitors maybe, but we're one of the first and reported at that point 2.6 million P14 data wow. items electronically. It took a little bit of time to do that. The service improved over the years. That then led into RTI introduction in 2012. And so uh, HMRC sort of came to us. In fact, we met with David Gork, the former Treasury Minister. We met with him before the Conservative government came into power. In fact, the coalition government came into power with the concept of this dynamic tax calculations by banks and kind of resisted that heavily, thinking what a disaster that would be. But around came the birth of RTI. And so it was an element of thinking, OK, let's see what your dreams are, government, HMRC, and where you want to go. And let's see where the industry is and how can we reach there. But equally, there was a, a team set up of data items, which looked like exactly the same data items you would get on a paper form. And there was an element of, we need to transition this from a paper form into actually something more automatic and electronic. So we were heavily involved in uh, meetings with HMRC in London quite often, BCS offices and HMRC offices to come up with a better design. I'm not sure we necessarily got to heaven position, but we got a long way from what could have been hell. And I think we ended up to something that actually could work, although it's still a little problematical at times. So following on then from the from the, the the hell analogy, if you like, obviously your specialism now is compliance strategies within payroll. So where do you think the big risk challenges are now going forward, especially bearing in mind everything we've, we've recently been through? Yeah, sure. I've sort of got myself a lot more involved social media wise as well. And you have your wonderful group as well, Nick, and you see the questions and things being raised. I do. But uh, for some time, there's been major concerns. So the major risk areas I see in payroll and employment law are national minimum wage. I think that's still very much there. It is complex law and little understood. Most people think national minimum wage is about paying a national minimum wage rate, and it's not. It's about recording accurate time work and making sure it's paid 
following any deductions or other items which may be considered for the benefit of the employer. So some people think, oh, if I just pay the hourly rate, that's fine. But then they operate hours rounding. So if someone's in late, they knock off 15 minutes when they're five minutes late, or they make them stay behind to cash up after shop closure, but they don't pay them for that time, or they make them train at home. There's all these sorts of things continue. And there's an element of understand national minimum wage law because the enforcers are coming. And I think that's that's been seen over the past few years. And with the pandemic, I think we may have dropped it a little bit and not realised that actually when things start to get back to normality, it could prove to be a major risk area because NMW activity is coming into play. The other area is the Taylor Review on Employment Rights and Employment Law. And it's fairly evident that even though the Working Time Directive came in many years ago, that holiday pay practices are wrong. So quite a lot of employers are not actually paying the amounts due. In fact, the Keep Britain paid report from 2019 identified that 1.8 million employees are not receiving their holiday pay entitlements that they're due under the Working Time Directive and the Employment Rights Act. And I think from lots of discussions, there is lots of confusion on those sorts of practices and uh, and an area where the new single enforcer is going to be appointed by business enterprise and industrial strategy, the department for, to come into play. Will that be HMRC as with NMW? Don't know. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but the new enforcer will enforce holiday pay and national minimum wage law. The challenge with holiday pay is at the moment, if it's wrong, an employee has to take you to court. When the enforcer comes in, the enforcer will make you pay it. So it's not a one by one case. The other area, I guess, that's coming up is off payroll workers for April 2021. So those that are currently working as contractors that are actually seen pretty much to be doing the job of an employee will be considered that they need to have tax and NI deducted off their invoice amounts, minus any VAT and expenses they may apply to the invoice. And uh, that hits larger private sector employers from April 2021. Are we prepared? And I think many will not be and they're not really readying in time. Or many employers don't actually know that those people exist in their business because they have nothing no. to do with HR necessarily or the payroll department. So it's an element of a major change for April 2021. And we've got too much disturbance already with Brexit and pandemic. So it's a uh, start to prepare. But there are other things like maternity rights. Uh, salary sacrifice is another area which is little understood by many. It's a fairly complex area. But uh, there's a feeling quite often that salary sacrifice is about someone buying something. They're not buying anything. They're being given it for free and the basis that they take a pay cut. And so what's the difference? And there is a subtle difference in law that many people just don't understand. And that may have been caught out in furlough grant claims because I suspect that many have claimed furlough grants without realizing that furlough grant is post-sacrifice pay. So it's tough it's very complex and sometimes you need uh, very strange minds like mine maybe <laughs> to figure it out. I guess when it comes to salary sacrifice, I mean, the clue is in the name somewhere, if you think about it, um, about what that is, as opposed to being a grant, because the, 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 you know what it's called kind of gives it away. What I would mention for those listening to this, if you want further advice on national minimum wage uh, governance, and of course, uh, the enforcement uh, body consultation uh, piece that's, that, that's, uh, that Simon referenced, I have recorded a podcast already um, called Pay Governance and the Good Work Plan, which is with Helen Kay and Chris Robson from Deloitte. It was recorded back in February. And of course, as we've seen over recent months, uh, legislation moves very quickly. But you may still find some very useful information in that podcast and I will try and update some of that information ready for 2021 as well but absolutely right Simon some interesting uh, elements you've referenced there and IR35 in particular one that's very relevant for me as a recruiter because of course we deal with contractors so it's a uh, legislation that uh, actually uh, crosses over into my realm and we've got to make sure we're also very much up to speed so uh, I absolutely agree with, with those points you've raised and, um, and, it, and it's great as well to, to just to re-reference 
the importance of payroll and why you know we need to raise the profile because it is incredibly complex. Um, it's not being made any simpler necessarily with the amount of changes that we're, we're going to be experiencing going forward. And I think it's really good to, to bring that to the fore. Now, look, we're going to jump to a quick advert break. When we come back, we're going to find out about what the major challenges and opportunities are for the payroll industry going forward. So please stay tuned. Have you ever asked yourself, how can I recruit payroll staff effectively? Please don't give up on your recruitment project just yet. Here at JGA Payroll Recruitment, we appreciate the difficulties associated with attracting, recruiting and retaining top payroll talent. We also understand just how costly a poor payroll hire can be. JGA Recruitment are a niche payroll recruitment agency who will partner with you to resource payroll candidates who will improve both the accuracy and efficiency of your payroll department. Contact us today on 01727 800 377 or visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more. Welcome back. Now, I'm going to quickly find out before we jump into the future of payroll, a little bit more about you, Simon, if we may. So first question, short and sharp. How do you relax in your downtime? How do I relax? During the pandemic, it's been quite (laughs) tough. So Lego has become a little bit of a hobby during the pandemic. Uh, I have four grandsons. I know, far too young to have grandsons but I have four grandsons the eldest is four and the youngest is about uh, four months they actually bring a lot of excitement to us as a family and so family time is great when we can have it the pandemic has been a bit of a strain to an extent with that sort of family life but uh, fortunately, uh, my wife is the primary carer for a lot of those children, as my children are all key workers, so acts as the child care. Ah, okay. So the, you could say there's an element of contradictory application of advice on the basis that generally we wouldn't normally mix, but for child care, you have to. Plus all the tier structure differences throughout the UK. Have to see if that all changes tonight and see if that, uh, fortunately, I've tended to be in a lower tier area, whereas lots of colleagues have found themselves very much more restricted. Uh, Relaxation-wise, tends to be a little bit of sport. So I actually went to a first football fixture last week. I saw posh or peterborough united as some may know it beat west ham united am i allowed to say that to people but they were the under 21 team in the uh (laughs) in the in the cup match uh so that that was great to be um, in a crowd of 2000 socially distance uh first football game for some time fortunately uh or unfortunately my, my son works uh for the posh on as a fan appreciation officer so uh, at times he's a student teacher so a little bit of connection with the football that are Amazing. they my team well, no Barnsley Town are my team <laughs> there you go well I'm a I'm an avid Spurs fan and uh, this will be published uh, by the time this is published the result will be known but we've got Liverpool this evening in the uh, title decider I would call it not that we've won anything for many many years but the year does end in a one next year so if you're a Spurs fan we're automatically optimistic I tell you what, this wasn't a list as a question I was going to ask you but I just I'd love to get your take on this as a payroll profession you, you mentioned then your children are all key workers so obviously applause uh, where necessary for, for those individuals who are you know, putting themselves at risk to, to support others I have seen a lot of um, quotes I think it was Carsten Stair mentioned you know there was champion payroll as that sort of fourth emergency service and not not to to, to belittle any of the key workers that are, that are putting their lives at risk to support others but how have you viewed the payroll industry during this pandemic in the you know in the efforts they've had to go to often in isolation uh, to work very long hours to keep those furlough employees paid and of course the, the non-furlough employees uh, paid as well handling new legislation almost daily what's what's for your view been on on the payroll industry reacting and adjusting to to what has also been an incredibly difficult circumstance for those for those professionals well we're either all insane or we're doing it to keep our sanity seems to be but uh i, I think payroll people generally are kind-hearted and want to help and ensure that people uh, continue to be able to live so they've put their shoulder to the wheel if that's an appropriate expression and have really gone past the mark required of helping their colleagues continue to keep 
Britain paid. And keeping Britain paid is really important for life, the economy, family, etc. Otherwise, there'd be significant social problems. Sure. Of, of which some are developing because there is still loneliness and uh, aspects. So we have to keep positive. But uh, you, you're right, Nick. I've probably done about 60 webinars since the pandemic start. The first few weeks, it seemed like we're doing three a week, uh, which takes yeah. quite a lot of effort. Uh, and the payroll professionals have probably kept late nights going getting things sorted. There have been over 30 changes to the coronavirus job retention scheme and subtle changes, some of them, but that's meant requirements to recalculate, calculate, then get data late. It's been quite a challenge for the payroll profession and all pretty much done remotely from home. So there's an element of thinking what would happen with home working. And I think generally home working has proved it can work. There are some difficulties with it. There are some challenges, but actually uh, the productivity levels we found with home working in SD Works is that actually things increased a little bit. But I think equally, if you've got an adrenaline rush where you've got all this activity to do that you just get through it and you work your way through it and wonder at the end how you did it. So I think we'll reflect back and think, oh, do you remember that 2021? Indeed. The challenge sometimes, I think, Nick, is payrollers are quite poor at blowing their own trumpet. So there's an element of uh, sometimes great activity, great effort can sometimes go a bit unnoticed. So it's just making sure that uh, the elevation of the importance is retained. Otherwise, uh, it can be a little bit of a, well, we don't need you anymore now. It's all fixed. A recent webinar uh, I, I delivered actually said that point. I, I'm probably, I probably delivered it slightly crassly, but deliberately crassly so, in the sense that payroll people need to shout a bit more. Or what will happen is we've raised the profile now. We've had you know Australian prime ministers commend the work payroll professionals have done to keep their, their countries paid. But if we don't continue to speak up and if the payroll industry remains quiet, then it's likely to revert back to where it was before. And I'm hoping there'll be more people that find their voice to to champion themselves and to champion the work the industry's done, like you've obviously been doing and like I've been trying to do as well, uh, because there is an opportunity, I think, now, hopefully, where payroll is more in people's consciousness. If you're not working in payroll, they're more familiar with who their payroll people are and the work that they've been doing. Um, and I'm really hopeful that going forward, people will find their voice to keep that keep that driving forward. Well, I'm wondering how many uh, payroll professionals were still awake at 12 o'clock on Monday night doing work. And I suspect there's quite a few. Um, I could certainly see on social media some of the reactions, even just after midnight, people saying, well, I've missed the deadline. What do I do now? Well, luckily, they've always got you on hand, Simon, even at that time. And we've established that in a group that uh, there's a few of us that are quite nocturnal. Um, and you're definitely one of those, uh, as we've established. I think there was a message I put out recently that just said, who else is still awake? And it was about <laughs> quarter to one. And I think you were one of the first people to respond. So let, let me jump back into finding out more about you. Um, if you could invite three people to a dinner party, who would they be and why? And they can be um, dead or alive. Oh, that's a difficult one. Uh, so three people to a dinner party, who and why? Well, I'll pay tribute possibly to someone. So uh, he he unfortunately passed away in May, but I actually I'd like to have Norman Green back again and have uh, sure. just to interact again with him. Uh, not for any uh, particular special reason other than I saw him as a good friend in, and a good friend to the industry. Now, if we're going to characters, you could say, or oh, Winston Churchill, wouldn't mind meeting him. Yeah. Um, I might find he may sell something to me I don't like is the only <laughs> challenge. It depends. But, uh, but I think it, it would be great to have Winston Churchill. And if I was uh, to name someone else, let's think who that would be. I don't know, Douglas Adams, and that may seem a little bit of a strange, uh, but Douglas Adams is the, uh, the writer of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, only because I just find that sort of humour uh, tremendous. And uh, Marvin the Robot is someone we should all have. <laughs> I love that, love that. Well, great have I lost a lot of people there? 
He didn't lose me. He didn't lose me. So that's good. I enjoyed, enjoyed that answer very much. Last question and before we revert back into the, the depths of payroll questioning for myself and what we're going to look forward to going forward. If you didn't work in payroll or shall I say payroll or software development, what would you be doing? Well, I'd probably be working with young people. I've, I've always enjoyed working with the young people and developing them. I'm a qualified youth worker going back some years ago. But the, the challenge I'd probably say is, is there enough money working with young people? It's, it's a tough one to say, isn't it, on that one? But uh, saying that, my all three of my children work in education uh, these days. I'm not sure if I would have had the qualifications to become a teacher uh, because I think education was different in the past. And uh, I, I did A-levels to get my English O-level. It's kind of that type of background. And uh, I had the fortune of doing my master's later in life, whereas these days university study is more common. But uh, development of young people has always been important to me. So let's jump back in then. We've talked a little bit about the major challenges legislatively that we, we're, uh, I say, looking forward to for 2021. But what are some of the opportunities for the industry going forward? OK, I think the industry needs a little bit of a shake up and it's looking at how that's going to operate. So I'm hearing a lot of conversation around on payroll on demand, and it's something that we've played around with for some years. And in fact, in, in SD Works, the pay solution is actually a real-time calculation basis. I think it's now moving on to freedom of choice on individuals potentially choosing their real pay days, dealing with different groups. In, in the past, we've tended to have to deal with that by having different payrolls, doing different things. There's an element of is the technology these days, is that really still necessary or can you actually build it so that uh, you can react immediately? When you merge companies, do they really need to change paydays? Do, when you want frequency changes, do they really need or do you put more choice? Now, I think there are a lot of mechanisms around which kind of indicates their pay on demand, but they're really operating a temporary loan or advanced type capability. And there's an element of thinking, actually, let's move to a structure where the pay cycle can be what you choose. The HMRC cycle can be whatever HMRC say it is. And the business accounting cycle can be anything you like because it becomes much more transactional. So that's a little bit where my head goes. And then also there's an element of having things much more interactive so people can do more themselves. Now, some of that will ring alarm bells for payroll professionals because we like to check and verify, ensure it's correct. Uh, make sure it doesn't mess our cycles up and there's an element do we actually still need our cycles or can we be driven by technology to work in different ways so i think it's exciting times and we'll see what happens over the next few years based on what you've just told me if you were to put a time frame on it you know on the potential dissolution of the monthly pay cycle as we know it to be at the moment with pay on demand solutions coming into the market in whatever guise they might be with it be it loans or advances or whatever it seems to be that that's something that, from my side, looks like it's going to happen at some point in the future. The the monthly routine payroll cycle as we know it now is likely to change and, and probably will become an on-demand process. But how long do you think it will take for that to be fully adopted until that sort of becomes the norm? Or indeed, do you think it never will? Um, it may never, but I'm trying to think new law implementation like holiday pay and astronomy wage have been around for 20 years. Have, are we fully there on the application of those in employment? And the answer is potentially no. Uh, when will those sorts of freedoms come into play? I think there is a question, Nick, of whether people actually want those freedoms. And I think sure. what people may want is still a monthly cycle, but they want to choose when that monthly cycle is. Will they really want to draw down money every day? Not sure if most people will, because that's not how their bills and mortgage are going to be taken. So I guess if if the mortgage company would take a little bit of money every day, then you may want to be paid every day. So I think it's more freeing up or giving the capability and choice. I think it's a little bit like flex schemes. Flexible benefit schemes are there to allow us to make choices that fit us. But I suspect that 8% of people that make a choice 
and they're free to make the choice. So it is their choice. Will they change it next year? And I think actually a lot don't. I've not heard anyone in the pearl industry give me that response, and yet it makes total sense to me. I'll tell you what, I asked my own employees uh, only this week, uh, you know, would you like me to advance you know, the payroll cycle so that you actually receive your pay before Christmas if you've got Christmas spending to do, but it does mean you're going to have a long period until the end of the next pay cycle, obviously end of January, which could be a five, six-week gap. You know, would you rather I just maintain it because at the minute we pay at the end of the month? The vast majority said they would rather it didn't change. They're quite happy. They don't want to go six weeks until the next cycle. They'd rather be paid as normal. And very few, if any, actually came back and said they wanted it early. And that surprised me. I, I think in my mind, I just assumed everyone would say yes, you know, money sooner. And actually, no one said yes. They, 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 they've, as you say, they've got their direct debits sorted out. They don't want to put themselves in a position where they've spent anything too soon. And um, it was a bit of a surprise to me, if I'm honest. So I think the way you've put that is it, it makes total sense. And not a way that I've considered it before. I think I've, I'm always sort of jump onto yes, that's the future. Yes, we need change. And actually, change can happen, but only if people want it. And not everyone always wants it. We do like. Uh, habitual behaviours. We like normality and and, um, reliability. So it's interesting the way you put that. Yeah. I think we also like to be free or can think we're free. So I think there's an element of if we're given the freedom to choose, we're happy. Sure. Will we choose to do something different is a different matter. So my last question before I open the vaults is this. Now, obviously, you work for uh, one of the international leading payroll service providers at SD Works. Um, it means you obviously, particularly in the payroll software development, you're very much at the coalface of, of payroll innovation. You've talked a little bit about you know, more um, automation coming into payroll departments. Uh, we're going to see a lot more AI coming into payroll departments. What are the technical innovations you're most excited about? And maybe we're, we're not there yet. Maybe you're behind the scenes, you've looked at things like blockchain, whatever it might be. What are the things that, that, that you are privy to that perhaps us outside of your forums and your, and your associations may not be as privy to that you're really excited about coming in? Well, initially, I think it's more about human education, if I'm going to put it that way. Yeah, I mean, you'll know that th- throughout my career, if there's been an opportunity to study, a study, and even now you could say I'm not doing a doctorate or I'm not doing anything formally academic, but I'm always studying change and in information that comes through. And uh, I've signed up for OU courses in the past and I've done them so public speaking with Barack Obama and whatever else I think it's always good to keep your mind open to new uh, innovations and so for the next few years I'm thinking the transformation of education is going to be key in payroll so digitalization of that type of concept and so I guess you could say that's probably a strange area to stray I think we've gone to a point of thinking everything should be systemized and automatic to the extent of actually the world is too complicated for that we do still need experts educated payroll professionals but is there an easy means for them to obtain that information? So I think integration is the other key. So things tend to be in isolated chunks. So now there's an element of thinking, let's bring everything into one so that actually I can do any activity anywhere. So I've got my pay slip. I can go and order a passport. I can notify people of change of address. There's an element of actually integrating payroll into the world of activity and interaction with government so that if you're actually doing one activity you're doing them all and that's where i'd really like to go because at the moment it seems strange that you tell your payroll department you've changed address they obviously tell hmrc who ignore it because it's not you as an individual (laughs) and uh, of thinking actually do we start looking to see the employee experience needs to be integrated into life and so that it's much more joined up. And the technology these days is there to do it. So let's do it more. We're definitely on a journey of a more holistic function anyway. Everything seems to be more employee-centric now than it's ever been before. So I think you're definitely on, to, you know, on trend with, the, with, the, with that response. So I, I sound like you're about to uh, add an additional point. Um, I've forgotten it. <laughs> Perfect. Well, let me open the vault then. I'm going to ask you some, uh, some same questions we have this in every episode of the Peril Podcast. <laughs> Entering the vault. For those listening, I'd love if you can give some advice. So the first question is this. One piece of guidance you would give to someone working in payroll right now. 
uh, one piece of guidance, never shy away from something difficult, give it a go. Because if you do, uh, you'll become an expert and be valued by your employer. Excellent. If you had the power of foresight and could change the entire payroll industry with one action or improvement, what would that action or improvement be? Uh, (laughs) That's a difficult one. One thing to change the payroll industry. I'm not sure if I know uh, a good enough answer for that, Nick. I may have to think about that and come back to it. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back. I remember Kate Upcraft telling us we needed a payroll governance, and that stuck with me ever since. And uh, I know someone with your uh, your experience is get, it will have something. There's probably too many. Maybe I've, maybe I've made it difficult by giving you just uh, just one action. But uh, let's go to this question then. In hindsight, what's one thing you now know that you wish you had known when you began your career in payroll? I wish I'd known how exciting it could be. Uh, initially because uh, I kind of fell into it and had an aptitude for it but my background is really IT but with an aptitude for the payroll aspects and complexity of law I think predominantly because law reads like code and so if you can program and know how to structure programs and the if statements then law is exactly the same basis so it doesn't do what you think it should it does what the words say and programs are exactly the same would that really help me at the front i don't know i think i've had a series of unfortunate accidents along the way that have brought great benefit and i don't regret any of that right you just referenced my daughter's favorite books of the series of unfortunate events so uh I like that. And uh, as you said, you, I, I think any answer that tells us you never knew how exciting payroll could be should be uh, up in quotation marks anyway. So, well, I yeah, I could say, is, is payroll sexy? Of course it is. What a great way to finish and round off the podcast. Is payroll sexy? Of course it is. Excellent. This has been an absolute pleasure, Simon, joining me today on the payroll podcast. Um, if there are people listening to this, they want to connect with you online. Um, obviously, I'm going to put links for those uh, who want to connect directly in the show notes. Check those out to both sdworks.co.uk and payadvice.uk, which, of course, is Simon Parsons' very own website. But are there any other links you'd like to mention where people can reach out to you directly? If people are interested in uh, electronic exchange problems, and there's irene.net. Uh, I mentioned that one, which is fairly new. But if you're wanting to connect and you've got problems, uh, those organisations are great. And, uh, of course, CIPP is a great source, along with all the others. Great, great. Well, I'll make, definitely make sure I add the link to irene.net to the show notes as well. And I'll add your LinkedIn profile, if I may, Simon, too. So if anyone wants to reach out direct, they can do so. Please remember, of course, my name is Nick Day. I'm CEO of JJ Payroll Recruitment as well. So if you do have a payroll-related vacancy that you would like some specialist payroll recruitment support with, please do reach out to me directly. You can catch me at nick at jgarecruitment.com or give me a call or any of my team a call on 01727 800 377. It just leaves me to say thank you ever so much for listening to this Peril podcast throughout 2020. I want to take this opportunity to wish you all a wonderful and prosperous 2021. And I look forward to bringing you all the next episode of the Peril podcast real soon. Take care of yourselves and each other. And of course, a huge thank you to yourself, Simon Parsons. Till next time. Thank you so much for tuning into the Payroll Podcast with Nick Day of JGA Recruitment. If you need help with a current payroll vacancy, then please get in touch with Nick and his team. All contact details can be found in the episode notes. In the meantime, to make sure you never miss a future episode, please subscribe to the show through any of your favorite podcast channels. Till next time.